So where does the stretch shortening cycle sit within these eccentric concentric um, contractions? Well, it's a slightly long paragraph, but it's important that we set this in stone. By definition, stretch shortening cycle means that the pre-activated muscle, that is an isometric phase, is first stretched, eccentric phase, upon contact with the ground. So the way to think about this is, think about this in, for example, the running action in this, in this example. In the case of the leg extensor muscles during running or hopping, for example, this eccentric phase during the breaking phase of the contact is then followed without delay by the shortening, the concentric action during the final push off. So imagine during a running action that what you have is you have the, uh, the foot, it's coming in contact with the ground. We go through eccentric loading because we've got a break, so we've got to decelerate. We then go into an isometric phase where there is no either lengthening or shortening. And then as we start to, to drive off the ground, we start to go from heel strike, in essence, to toe off, we start to then get a shortening action as we start to accelerate. And all the stretch shortening cycle refers to is the movements in terms of, in this case, the leg extensor muscles, but in any, any muscle group, the movement from what is fundamentally a eccentric contraction to a concentric contraction. So what do we need to remember? Well, there's a couple of major points. One, the muscles are very active during the pre-contact and breaking phases. And two, they are less active in the push-off phase of the cycle. And I'll show you that in, in, in a moment with, with some schematics. And so what that leads to is because we know what's going on here in terms of these major points, there are a number of forms of identification of often being used to identify this kind of stretch shortening cycle response. So, for example, the lowest point of the centre of mass or the transition of horizontal ground reaction forces recording from the negative, the braking to the acceleration push off, push off phases. So if we understand that fundamentally the stretch shortening cycle is eccentric to concentric, and if you have means of recording that, as we can do with force plates, you're fundamentally able to isolate that stretch shortening action. You're, you're recording the time taken to go from a deceleration to an acceleration. And that's all, that's all the stretch shortening cycle is. Now, if we look at this, this um, really nice schematic, which is from Pavo Comey's lab, here we've got it in a kind of a, a, a cartoon representation. So here we've got the muscle, it's, it's, it's under pre-activation. We hit the ground. So now as they hit the ground, we go into eccentric uh, muscle action because fundamentally we're into the braking phase so the foot is coming into contact with the ground we've got to cause that decelerational effect we then will actually have between this phase here and this phase here there is a point where the muscle is neither lengthening or shortening it's very very small in terms of the running action and as the speed increases this this isometric phase becomes shorter and shorter and shorter we then go into the accelerational phase whereby the muscle is shortening. So we're going from eccentric to concentric. And what we can see on the panel to the right, panel B, is we can see what is happening here, both in terms of our muscle activation, this is EMG data, but also here in terms of the force that's being produced. We'll come to the forces in a moment. But you can see here, what is happening in terms of the muscle activation? That as the, 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 the muscle is coming into contact with the ground, that is the foot is coming into contact with the ground and the muscle is being activated, we see significant increases in muscle activation. But what we then start to see is we start to see a decrease in the amount of force. Why? Because as we start to accelerate off the ground, the amount of muscle activation starts to decrease. So when we look at our um, force trace that you can see here, this negative curve that you've got here is fundamentally the eccentric phase. This represents the, the notion of the braking force. And we start to accelerate as we start to, to, to leave the ground. And so all the stretch shortening cycle is getting at, when we're interested in it, is, is really the time taken to move from this eccentric to this concentric phase of the action.
So how does this then relate in terms of the notion of power? And how does this then relate in terms of being uh, a, a parameter of interest in relation to strength, strength and conditioning coaches or exercise physiologists or even people like sport therapists, for example? Well, stretching of an activated muscle leads to greater work and power during the subsequent shortening phase of the contraction. And that the amount of the concentric work is dependent upon the coupling time. In other words, there's a fine balance to be struck between um, how long you are, in essence, in that breaking phase and how long and how quickly you can move from breaking phase, in essence, to the, to the accelerational phase. Let me put that into context. When you think about this now in terms of the muscle acting like a, a spring, and when the muscle acts like a spring, what you've got is, if I've got a big spring, and this has got a big spring in front of me, if I push down on that spring, okay, I'm pushing onto the spring, and what I'm doing is I'm imparting energy into that spring. And if I push the spring all the way down, I put all that energy into it, I've now got what is, in essence, potential energy. It's not doing anything, it is stored in the spring. If I then release the spring, of course the spring boings and it goes jumping up into the air. So it's gone from potential energy into kinetic energy. Now, the muscle works in exactly the same way. As we go into eccentric loading, fundamentally that is, that is actually a muscle action, as we've learned previously, which is predominantly, predominantly, not solely, but predominantly ATP independent. It uses very, very little energy to generate the force. The majority of the energy that is used is in essence to uncouple the uh, actin myosin filament at the onset and then basically for that breaking action at the very end uh, to, 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 to basically get that, that slowing down. Very different to what's happening under concentric loading because under concentric loading fundamentally the, 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 the acceleration requires continual ATP turnover. So if if in the muscle, if I can impart more energy, or store more energy under the eccentric load in the muscle acting like a spring, I have the potential to convert a lot of energy into the accelerational phase, which is the concentric muscle action. But remember, it's power. That's the key thing. So it's not just simply how much energy. It's how much and how quickly. So in other words, this is the fine balance. Yes, we can in essence store energy in the muscle. We can, you know, a bit like putting it in, you know, pushing down on that spring. But the key is how quickly can I move from the eccentric phase to the concentric phase? And that is stretch shortening power. That is why we're inter interested in the stretch shortening cycle. Because the quicker that you can do that, the quicker that you can do that, Think about it very logically in terms of, say, running action, the less time you have in contact with the ground and potentially the more power you can produce. So it's a balance between how much energy can be, be, can be stored, potentially, and how quickly I can move from potential to kinetic energy. And that's why we are very, very interested in this, because it's so relevant in a lot of sporting disciplines. Um, anything from even endurance running, right? If I, can, if I can spend less time in contact with the ground, I use less energy, very important for an endurance runner. But it's so fundamentally important into, into things where we've got change of direction. So if you're not sure, go back and look at the lecture material on change of direction. That stretch shortening cycle plays such an important part in that as a parameter. It's so fundamentally important in, in, in contact sports as, as, as well. So we get this notion of elastic energy, this notion of energy being stored during the eccentric phase and then recovered, not fully, you don't recover it all, let's be absolutely clear, during the, the positive or the concentric work phase. So it's how much can I store, but how quickly can I move from elastic to, to kinetic energy, or potential to kinetic energy. But here's the thing, potential energy can be wasted, and it's wasted as heat, if the concentric action is not followed but does not follow immediately after the eccentric one. And that's the really important part. That's where this time comes in. If there is a delay, for whatever reason, this might be a training effect because somebody hasn't trained the, the, the process, this neuromuscular component, to, to actually shift from the eccentric to the concentric. Or it might be that you know we, we, 
it's a new muscle, a new muscle action. It might be that we've got somebody who's recovering from an injury. Whatever it is, if we don't go from that eccentric to the concentric fast enough, that potential energy starts to be lost. We can't keep it stored. Okay, you know, imagine I'm pushing down on a really big spring. I can put, I can push down on that spring, I'm pushing it down. But the longer I try and hold it, the harder it becomes. The harder it becomes. The harder it becomes. And it's the same equivalent as that eccentric phase has been undertaken. You're storing energy, but energy. It's, it's there. We don't have a kind of a, a battery to store it. We start to lose it and we lose all forms of energy really in, in the shape of heat. So let's see this in, in action. And we're going to look here at this really nice schematic. It looks a bit complicated. It's not overly complicated in terms of what we're, what we're dealing here. So we're going to look on panel A to start with. And so what we've got is we've got, um, it's kind of like an XY, but it's inverted, but you'll see why in a moment. We've got grams here, and this is representing force. And then we've got millimetres here, which is representing, in essence, change in length. So what we have here, we're going to start right down this point here. So we're going to move from point A to point B. And at point A to point B, the muscle is simply being stimulated. And then you can see it's going to be stretched. OK, and it's actually stretched to 20 millimetres. So it's gone from 16 millimetres to 20 millimetres. So it's moving from point B to point C. OK, and so what you then get is not surprisingly, as you stretch it, look what's happened to the tension. The tension at point B is around about 50 grams. It's increased to around about 200 grams when we get to point C, because remember, you're putting the muscle under under stretch. The net result is there's going to be an increase in tension in um, the muscle. Now, what happens is at this point here, we hold that for five seconds. So we simply hold it for five seconds. In other words, we're not moving instantly from our eccentric to our concentric. But notice what happens. We hold it. And this is the time from point C to point D. And the tension in the muscle dissipates. It drops from about 200 grams to about 100 grams. OK. And then what we end up with is this re reduction that we have here, as I say, in the amount of tension. And then if we then look at this in terms of the stored energy, it's represented in this relationship here between the, the length and the tension in the muscle, this grade area. Now what I want you to do is look at the panel to the right. Same principle applies. We stimulate the muscle. We increase it to a length of 20 millimetres. So we've got, again, a four millimetre increase, exactly as we had um, in our previous example over here. But now there is no pause. We move immediately from the muscle being stretched, so that is the muscle under breaking force, remember, we move immediately to the notion of the muscle shortening. So you see we're going from our length of 20 to our length of 17. But look at the amount of energy that is there. In other words, we don't lose the tension in the muscle. We don't lose the stored energy. And that is the difference between moving from an eccentric, this is kind of our eccentric, to our concentric action rapidly compared to having a delay. So in this example here, I'm moving and I'm retaining the stored energy, the tension in the muscle, and I'm able to generate the force. This is the representation of, the, of, in essence, the amount of force that can be produced. If I have any delay, I start to lose the stored energy, we know we lose it in the form of heat, the net result is you can't sustain the tension in the muscle and the amount of active force that you can produce also decreases. So this is why the stretch shortening cycle becomes so, so important to us and so much of interest to us in the world of exercise physiology. And we can see this perhaps in a perhaps an a, a easier to, to understand example if perhaps you're more biomechanically minded. So here we've got um, we've got our time on the x-axis, and then we've got tension on our on our y-axis. It's taken from the reference, um, again, it's a Comey reference. In panel A, 
you can see quite simply what ha happens under concentric uh, loading. And so what you can see is, is we move from a joint angle from about 100 degrees to a joint angle of 175 degrees. So remember, this is just accelerational forces. You can see the amount of, 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 of tension that's being produced in the muscle. In panel B, what we have is we have our eccentric muscle action here, followed immediately, immediately by our concentric. And notice what happens under the concentric loading, we get this significant increase. Again, we're moving from the same joint angles, look, 100, 175, 100, 175 joint angle. It's just being preceded by an eccentric um, uh, phase where the muscle is under stretch. And suddenly you get a very significant increase in the amount of force being produced. Now look what happens in panel C. In panel C, we have our same eccentric phase over the same range of motion. Okay, we produce the, the, the force, but the result here is we have a delay. We have a delay here of 0.9 seconds, and you can see that the force starts to dissipate. We then go into the concentric phase and notice how much lower the force is compared to panel B. And it is only marginally higher than we see in panel A, where there is no eccentric contraction preceding what is going on. In other words, as soon as you have that delay, as soon as you increase the time between the eccentric, that is the muscle under stretch, and the concentric, that is the muscle shortening, as soon as you have a delay, we start to lose energy. That stored energy starts to dissipate. The net result is, because we lose that energy, then the ability to to impart that potential energy into a uh, kinetic energy disappears. So how do we actually assess this? We can see the relevancy of it. How do we assess this and how do we interpret this? Well, the conventional method actually is to use what is called a drop jump test. And explain why drop jump testing is, is so relevant for this. Well. If you think about the notion of a drop jump, what you have is you have an athlete or whoever it is, and they drop from a designated height. And as they step off, they fall, they fall towards the ground. As they hit the ground, of course, what happens is they have to bend the knees and they generate a breaking force. So the muscle is now under eccentric loading. What we then ask them to do is go as quickly as possible from that breaking force to re-accelerate into a vertical jump movement. So we go from an eccentric braking force to a concentric accelerational force. In other words, we've gone through the stretch shortening cycle characteristics. And so what you do is you do it onto a jump mat or a force plate. And all we're interested in in this example really is the contact time and the flight time. And we can also estimate vertical jump displacement. So in other words, we're interested in, in, in how much force they produce in both the contact phase, that is in the braking phase, and the accelerational phase, and how long they're in the air for. And that really tells us the amount of force capability we have in the stretch shortening cycle. So you might do it at different drop heights. So you might do um, for example, say 30 centimetre, 60 centimetre, 90 centimetre, and you look at, for example, the height that produces the greatest kind of displacement, you might compare the same height, say 60 centimetres, and do repeat trials, and you might compare that over time. So, if you imagine going from different jump heights, this becomes quite interesting. If I increase the jump height, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to the braking force? Have a think. It's probably already there. You've probably got it ticking in the back of your mind. As the height, drop height increases, because you're falling from a greater distance, the braking force that is needed to decelerate that body is also now increased. So in other words, we have potential here for greater eccentric force generation. But if I am falling from a greater height, then it's going to take me longer potentially to move from the deceleration to the acceleration. So that is that interplay that we've been referring to previously 
in terms of moving from the eccentric to the concentric phase. And that's why varying the drop height becomes actually quite interesting to us, because we can almost start to find if there is a sweet spot. Is there a, is there a point where fundamentally um, the contact time becomes so long that we in essence lose the force in the subsequent concentric phase? And that becomes of interest to us because actually that probably identifies for us a, a, a drop height that we can use in, in training. So what we have now is a measure of neuromechanical potentiation, neuromechanical power. Because remember, the amount of braking force that is initiated is fundamentally determined by the amount of motor units that are recruited. Remember that, in other words, it, to, to, to get muscle activation, you have to neurally recruit those motor units. So the greater the force that is needed, more motor units are being um, recruited to generate that force. So we know now that we've got a measure that is indicating for us not metabolic capabilities. This isn't about ATP turnover rates. I mean, it's there, but it's not what we're interested in. It's fundamentally about neuromuscular potential. How quickly can we, in essence, move from the eccentric to the concentric? which is a function of motor unit recruitment patterns. So let's see if we can look at that, this in action. So I'm going to show you this video here. This is a student, uh, one of our labs, dropping from a relatively low box height. I don't want you to watch what happens. Okay. So we're stepping off the box. So now, braking force. Acceleration. And so you can see in that example, you can quite clearly see what is going on. So let's just watch that again and follow what is, is happening. So notice a couple of... He steps off the box. We're in pre-activation phase now. So now he's in pre-activation phase. Remember, at, the, at this point, he's got no contact with the ground. So this is where we start to get into the notion. It becomes really interesting in the notion of things like what we call optic flow and so on. It's, the, the, there's, there's a lot of kind of cognitive processing going on, on here. But he's now going to make contact with the ground. There. So now the muscle is under eccentric loading, or it's starting that process. Let's see if we can pause him through. Now, you can just see, that's how quickly it was. And remember, this is in slow motion. So he's gone from that eccentric. Now we're starting to accelerate. So we've got, we've got now a measure on our plate here of how much force was needed, how quickly it was uh, imparted as he now starts to accelerate off the ground. And of course, the jump height, which is in, in essence a function of kind of uh, power, is a reflection really of how quickly he's able to move from the eccentric to the concentric phase. Okay, now in this example, he's going from a much greater height. So we've gone from 90 centimetres this time. Now, why don't you watch the difference? So again, hands on hips. Everything that we've, we, we thought about applies. Now watch. We're going to step off. So we're now in that pre-activation phase. So... He's dropping from a much higher height. It takes him longer, right, to hit the ground. Therefore, he's going to need um, he's going to need more force to um, basically uh, contact. Now look at how much longer he's on the ground. Look at that, and now we start to accelerate. So it's longer on the ground. You can see the amount of muscle activation that was needed in order for him to then get off the ground and accelerate. So what you now have is that kind of balance between what you see in terms of the low height where he, he could get off the ground very quickly because he didn't need an, a significant eccentric phase compared to the high height where a much greater eccentric phase was needed. So again, 90 centimeters, but notice no hands on hips. But again, watch here we go, pre-activation. There's no hands on hips, so we've got less control. There's the eccentric phase. 
there's the concentric phase accelerating up. So what you have is that indication in terms of the stretch shortening cycle capability, but there was a big difference that you saw between There's a big difference in terms of what you saw between this example where there was less control, there's more variability in the data, and what you saw with our male participant with the hands on the hips where there was more control. But in both instances, you could quite clearly see there's that breaking force as they're hitting the, the mat, moving into that ease, which is deceleration, moving into that accelerational phase. Now let's look at this in terms of actual data and see what we can, we can see in kind of data responses. This is from a really nice little study. So here we've got a series of drop heights and what we've got is three drop heights, 30, 45 and 60 centimetres. But what they've asked the participants do, to do is they've asked them to do it in three different ways. They've asked them to do this where they, they do the drop jump for height. So fundamentally in the drop jump for height what they're saying to them is we want you fundamentally to concentrate on how high you jump in the concentric phase. So if they're doing that they're fundamentally not interested in contact time, so they're going to spend longer on the ground. In the second condition here is the drop jump, but this time it is for contact time. So ignore how high you jump, just try and move as quickly as possible from the eccentric to the concentric phase. And in the final example, they were asked to try and amalgamate the two. In other words, try and jump as high as you can, but get off the force plate as rapidly as possible this being the optimal kind of representation of the stretch shortening cycle capability. So let's look at the differences. So if we look at the subsequent jump heights, so if we, if we just look at these, we're going to take just a fixed example. So if we take 30 centimetres, they, at 30 centimetres when they did it for height, they had a jump height, a subsequent jump height of 40.2 centimetres. When they did it for contact time, they had a consequent response of 12 and a half centimetres, so significantly reduced. And when they actually went for the amalgamation of the two, that's trying to focus on both height and contact time, 33.1 centimetres. So now, if we then go, well, actually, what was the contact time? Well, at 30 centimetres, that had a contact time of 409 milliseconds when they were concentrating on jumping for height. Compared to 141 milliseconds, when they were doing it for time and 177 milliseconds when they were actually doing it for, for, for both the combination of height and time. So if we then say, well, actually, if we take the function of height over time, remember it's power, so height is our representation of the amount of force being produced, that's the jump height, and the time is the representation of rapidity. So if we look at height over time, now you can see the subsequent effect. When they were asked to do it just for height, although they had the greatest jump height and therefore the longest contact time, the rapidity was, was long. So the height over time gives us 101 centimetres per second. That's what it, it, it equates to. When we go for contact time only, we end up at 90 centimetres per second. But when we have the optimal combination, in other words, we try and get that balance we're trying to move from the eccentric to the concentric, concentric, concentric as quickly as possible, but we're trying to do it ensuring that we've gone through as, as much of the eccentric phase as possible. It's almost certain in here that they've not gone through the full eccentric phase. They're, they're being too quick. In this example here, they're losing the potential energy that we talked about previously. They're spending too long on the ground. Look at the difference now. 191 centimetres per second. And you can see the same effect at all of the different drop heights. So this is a real indication for you about the impact that um, the stretch shortening cycle has, but fundamentally tells you something about the way in which you have to test this. You have to instruct your participants to, to really focus on dropping for height and time. They can't dilly-dally on the force plate and spending a long time trying to go through the deceleration to the acceleration, the longer they take on the force plate, then the more potential energy they lose. And you can see the effect when we go to say 60 centimetres. Look at the difference. If we take this as our optimal combination, look, we go 191, 188, 175. They're spending longer on the force plate. How do we know? Look at the contact times, 177, 180, 186. 
but the jump heights don't look particularly different. But you can see that it has had a subsequent effect on the amount of force being produced. So it's a really, really useful tool in terms of telling us that ability to move from an eccentric to a concentric phase. And what we have here is a parameter we're going to come to in a moment, which is what's called reactive strength index. Um, but what we have is just a representation in, in trials. And I want to show you this a little bit just to start to tempt this notion. We've got reactive strength index here, and then we've got time to stabilization on this panel here. But notice actually how repeatable these are. So when the correct instructions are provided, that is the participant is being asked to do this, and have been asked to do this in terms of ensuring that they're doing this for contact time and jump height. In other words, the optimal combination, we get very, very good repeatability in terms of the data that we're working with. And we can go a stage further here. So here we've got um, test number, so number of repeat trials. So they're doing six repeat trials. And what they've got here is repeatability in, in squat jumps, counter movement jumps, and drop jumps. And they've got this for both males, who are the white bars, and females, who are the gray bars. Now, this is where it gets quite interesting. Remember in the previous example, we're going, it looks quite repeatable. It does look quite repeatable. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But notice here, both a standard squat jump and a counter movement jump do appear to be very, very repeatable. But can you see here, there is a significant drop off, particularly in the males. It's also noticeable in the females. And it's noticeable in, in the male data, particularly between trial one and trial five. And between trial one and trial, uh, sorry, trial one, trial six, trial one and trial four, and trial one and trial um, three. So what is this telling us? Why is that happening? And the same you can see in the females, particularly between one, uh, one and three, one and four, and one and six. So why are we seeing that? Well, this is something that's really important. These tests, think about what is happening. You're using eccentrics and concentrics. There's a lot of neuromuscular recruitment going on here. They are neuromuscularly fatiguing so if you are going to do this kind of testing, we can see in the previous example, it's repeatable. But you have to ask yourself about what's the difference between these two conditions. It's the amount of time we allow between each of these tests. They are fatiguing. They don't look fatiguing. You're just doing a drop jump. But there is a lot of neuromuscular recruitment going on. You have to allow for dissipation of that fatigue between trials. And actually what we start to understand is you're probably looking at about a three to five minute recovery between each trial to get that level of repeatability that we see in this data set here, as opposed to what we're seeing here, where the trials are being actually repeated fairly, fairly close to each other. And so what you see is that this becomes very, very fatiguing. And in fact, even when you have a three to five minute recovery, you'll start to see that there'll be a drop off in the amount of, 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 of height um, uh, and, and force that can be produced across subsequent trials. When we look at this data set here, this is quite neat because what you can see here, we've got two different drop heights. So this is EMG data and you've got a drop jump uh, at 40 centimetres and a drop jump at 80 centimetres. And what you can just simply see is the, the degree of muscle activation in, 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 in two participant groups. And it's really interesting to see because it fundamentally shows you the difference in the neuromuscular activation. Notice at drop jump 80, particularly when we look at things like um, our rec fem, so if this is rectus femoris, significantly greater at drop jump 80 compared to, to 40. And even when we look in the gastroc, you can see exactly the same thing as well. So it's telling you the EMG is your proxy indicator of neural recruitment. If the EMG activity is greater, it's telling you there is a significant increase in neuromuscular recruitment, neuromuscular function. So as the drop height increases and the breaking force has to increase, then by definition, we're going to have to have more muscle activation to basically impart that breaking force. 
So this is really interesting because although we don't record EMG during these tests when we're working with, with athletes, it's a really useful index to have in terms of reinforcing that notion of the neural recruitment, but also kind of reinforcing that notion of the degree of neural fatigue that we were referring to previously.